Hello and welcome to the second video in the Snort video series. My name is Nick Mavis. I'm a research engineer under Cisco Talos under the detection response team. Uh, today I'm going to give you an introduction on writing rules for Snort 2. In order to complete this training video, you're going to need a working Snort 2 installation. You can either compile it from source or you can use the Docker image provided in the previous video on installation and configuration. To begin, I'd like to talk about the basic header of a rule. The header contains the following options, rule action, protocol, source IP and port, direction, and destination IP and port. The first option in the rule header is the action. For this series, we only have to worry about the alert action, but that says the rule will generate an alert when the rule content matches the traffic. Next, we have the protocol. In this example, we will only evaluate the rule against TCP traffic. Following that, you can see that we have the source IP and source port. It is also present at the end of the header for the destination IP and port. This will determine the flow of your rule, and you can define it in a few ways. You can use a static IP or port, a CIDR block, so for example, if you want to match traffic going to the 10 slash 8 network, you can use a comma separated list for ports and IPs as seen below. Here you see an example of some common HTTP server ports used in a list. And there's also a negation to define anything but the specified option. But most commonly working with rules, you're going to want to use the default variables provided by Snort. As you can see above, we have the home net and external net set, as well as HTTP ports. So this would be a rule geared towards going, uh, traffic going from your internal network to an external HTTP server. Typically, this would be used to be match on an outbound malware CNC rule. And lastly, you have your directional operator, which can be traffic going to the destination IP report or by directional inspection. All right, so let's move on to the meat of a snort rule. Uh, that is called the structure, and those include the rule message, content match, content match modifiers, the alternative data buffers, byte operations, regular expressions, and signature identification. Your rule may contain only a few of these, or it may contain only the required options. The only required option for Snort to process the rule is the signature identification option, which is also known as the SID. All right, so the first one, rule message. Very straightforward. Here at Chalice, we like to have a rule message that easily identifies the rule's purpose. So we define it with three different parts. A category, so we can easily group similar rule sets. Server, web app, and malware CNC are examples of that. And we have an affected product or malware family. This depends on what your category is. For a malware rule, we want to have a malware family, type of malware, and operating system associated with it. You can see win.trojan.zeus shown as an example. And the attempted action of whatever you're trying to cover. So whether it be a vulnerability being exploited or an outbound call from a piece of malware, you want to make sure it matches. The most important option to learn is the content rule option. It's the most used option and the base of pretty much all snort detection. And you're going to use it a lot. There are a couple ways to write a content match. The first one, you can see the word talos as the content match. And it's saying match the string talos anywhere within the incoming bytes of the packet. You can match an ASCII string, a string of hex bytes, or you can have a negative match as you saw with the destination IP and port. In the third example, you can see an exclamation point followed by the string snort. The exclamation point shows that this is a negative match for a content. So content matches by themselves aren't extremely powerful. What makes them powerful is your ability to declare detection windows and use them in creative ways. For that, we have a few options that allow you to define sliding windows for detection. The first one I want to talk about is offset and def. Offset and def are a pair and can be used in conjunction with each other. The offset means that I want to match x number of bytes from the beginning of the packet data so offset 10, as the first example states, would be looking for the word learn 10 bytes into the incoming packet data, and from there on out to the end of the buffer. Sometimes that is too much data to search, so we also include the def modifier. The def modifier will give us a sliding window of detection. When I only have offset 5, I'm saying I want to be given, begin looking for the content match talos 5 bytes from the start of the packet and anywhere within the next 10 bytes as defined by the def modifier. You can also use def by itself, but make sure you're aware that it assumes offset zero. Next, we're going to talk about distance and within. 
This is a lot more common than offset and def. You're going to use it a lot more because it's often more applicable in most situations. The difference is that distance is used when attempting to create a content match that is relative to the previous detection option. Now, that doesn't have to be another content match as there are a variety of different rule options that are applicable. But for simplicity, we're going to stick with content matches. Now, when you look at the first example, you see distance zero specified. The first content match is find, and the second one is me. What this says is after I've matched find, I want to find the string me anywhere after the point where I located find. You can also, once again, create a detection window using within. You can see that in the second example, where I have content snort and content rocks, that is saying after I match snort, I want to match the word rocks within the next 15 bytes. Pretty simple, right? So when you use them together, you can create very specific matches that you wouldn't be able to do with, without a detection window. This allows you to write better rules. In the third example, I am looking for the word bar 12 bytes away from foo and within three bytes, a very specific match. Another modifier that you're going to see is the fast pattern option. The fast pattern engine is extremely important to snort because it allows us to get better performance when evaluating snort rules. If we didn't have fast pattern, we would have a bunch of rules that would need to be evaluated all the way through left to right. This would cause us to spend far too much time in detection, making it difficult to run snort in line in your network. The fast pattern engine's job is to take the most unique content match and use that option first to determine if the packet is eligible for further inspection. So that means you're going to use the most unique content match we have and make snort evaluate it first before all others. For example, we have a content match for unique and the string word. Since rule options are evaluated left to right during detection, we would expect unique to be the first match. That is not the case since we declared word as the fast pattern match and to see if the package is eligible for further inspection. There are a few different options and some things to remember when using the fast pattern modifier. First, Snort will look for the fast pattern match anywhere in the packet data. It simply wants to determine if the rule should be evaluated against the incoming data quickly meaning that when I match on the fast pattern content, we would begin evaluating the rule normally from left to right again. The third example shows that word is relative to unique, using the within modifier. Word will be used as a fast pattern match. Once matched, it will look for the word unique, then again for word, but within 50 bytes of the previous match. Sometimes you're only going to have one very unique content match in your rule. We can detect this extremely fast by using the fast pattern only option which says after the fast pattern match has been found, do not look for it again. There's also another way to modify fast pattern using offset and length, but it is extremely uncommon. The last modifier I want to talk about is one of the most important things in the snort rule syntax, and that is alternative data buffers. These include HTTP buffers, the file data buffer, raw buffers, and SIP. The most commonly used type of buffer is HTTP buffers. This was implemented because we wanted the ability to decrease the amount of data we need to search through in HTTP traffic. They, they also allow us to know exactly which part of the HTTP request we are inspecting. We have a number of HTTP buffers, and you can look up in the SNORT manual, but I'm going to talk about some of the most common ones. HTTP URI, HTTP header, HTTP client body, and HTTP cookie. You use these following a content match with the appropriate buffer. So in the first example, we use the HTTP URI buffer to look for slash documents slash one dot doc only within the HTTP URI of a request. It is important to note these buffers will never be populated if the request is not actually HTTP traffic. Snort is extremely intelligent when it comes to identifying protocols within packet data. One thing to keep in mind when you have multiple content matches and buffers is that you have to specify the intended buffer after each content match. You can see in the second example that I have two content matches, and both of them have the HTTP URI buffer attached to them. If failed to specify the URI buffer on one of these matches, I would expand the content match search to the rest of the packet data. This would not only decrease performance, but it would raise the risk for false positives. Note that more than one modifier can be used after a content match, as seen with HTTP URI and distance in the example shown. HTTP header is also a popular buffer. Here I'm using it to detect a user agent that I've made up for the sake of this video. You will also notice that since I believe the match is extremely unique, I've specified the fast pattern only modifier to increase the rule's performance. The HTTP client body buffer is geared towards post requests for the most part. 
Normally, this would be used to detect something such as parameters in a form being submitted to a web server. And lastly, we have HTTP cookie. It is not always applicable since typically it's not enabled by default in Snort. However, if you do have it enabled, you can still use it. And if you don't, it will resort back to the HTTP header buffer. File data is another very important modifier, and it works a little different than the rest of them. File data is a sticky buffer, which means that instead of having to attach it to each content match, I can specify it once, and every detection option after that will be within the file data buffer unless specified otherwise. Now, this buffer is populated during file downloads directed towards the client. It works over multiple protocols such as SMTP, FTP, and HTTP. And it allows us to direct our detection options to the file itself, not the protocol. An extremely common use for the file data buffer would be JavaScript detection. In the second example, we have a rule matching collect garbage. This is a quick file detection rule matching a commonly used function in JavaScript-based exploits. Lastly, I'm going to briefly gloss over raw buffers. There are raw buffers. If we go back to the previous slide, you can see that I've mentioned in a comment that the HTTP URI modifier is a normalized buffer. Snort does perform certain normalization to make it easier for rule writers to detect evasions. For example, URL encoding is commonly seen in URIs and can be used to hide certain characters. The content match shown matches the URL encoding for dot dot slash, which is used in directory traversal attacks. In the HTTP URI buffer, this would be normalized to the ASCII characters so that we only have to write one rule to cover several ways to represent these characters. Let's talk about byte operations. They are an extremely useful tool for parsing binary file formats, and there are four options you're going to be able to use. The first one is byte jump. This has a very basic syntax. However, I recommend going to the Snort manual to determine all the additional parameters. I'm going to go over an example. In order to jump to a TIFF image IFD, we're going to need to use byte jump to extract the position of it. For this rule, we have the file data buffer specified, followed by a content match for the TIFF file magic in big endian in the first four bytes of the buffer. And then we know that the next four bytes relative to the file magic will be the offset of the TIFF IFD. So we use byte jump to extract four bytes from offset zero to the previous content match, meaning we will extract directly after the 0x 2a hex byte in the file magic. We use the big option to specify any in this. This moves the direction cursor to the offset value of those four bytes. Then we can do a content match within two bytes to match the tag for image width. I want to quickly talk about any in this since it was mentioned in the last slide. Any in this is the order in which bytes are arranged and stored in memory. The two formats you're going to see are big and little endian. Depending on the architecture of your host, you have to convert the bytes you wish to match to the resulting value so that it will be the same on both types of hosts. Thankfully, Snort does this for you with the big and little options for byte operations. Keep a mental note that network traffic is always represented in big endian, but you would need this distinction for things such as file formats. Next, we have byte extract, and it's a very similar syntax. There are a few different options, however. Here is detection for CVE 2006-0981. Win ace for our file name directory traversal. Once again, we use the file data buffer. Then we look for the RAR file magic. We know that within the binary structure of a RAR file, a hex character 0x74 represents a block type of head file. We verified that this is exactly 15 bytes from the file magic. Now we want to determine the length specified for the file name. We extract one byte. 23 bytes from our previous match, since it is relative. And we store that value in the name underscore length variable. We can use that length in our next content match as we look for the directory traversal within the value of name underscore length five bytes from where we extracted it. Byte test is going to be used to compare a specific value against a certain number of bytes within the file using a conditional operation. Conditional operators would be something such as greater than, less than, or equals to or variations of those three. This is 2008-2430, VLC media player wave integer overflow attempt. Once again, we use the file data buffer, we match RIF for the expected file magic, and then we verify a wave header marker exists four bytes from the RIF file magic. In order to look for this exploit, we want to read four little endian bytes and compare against the hex value in the third field. So we extract four bytes, check if they are greater than the hex value specified, one byte from the previous countdown match, and specify that as little endian. 
Due to the operations that occur when parsing this file format in VLC, a value greater than what is shown would cause an integer overflow. Last, we have byte math. Byte math syntactically is a little different, and it takes some time to get used to in comparison to the other options. I'm going to show you 2008-2927, pigeon, MSN, integer, overflow attempt. I truncated the first part of this rule since it's a very long rule, and we're going to, have to start analyzing it near the byte math operation. First, we have a negative content match of four null bytes, followed by a byte extract. One thing to note about byte extract is that since we have a negative content match prior to it, the byte extract is relative to the previous non-negative match. Since we can't look for data relative to something that shouldn't exist, we use the previous detection option. So here, we extract four bytes, 24 bytes from the previous non-negative content match, store it in a variable message underscore len, and we expect it to be little endian. Next, we need to calculate the length of the message offset field 20 bytes prior to the value we extracted. We use byte math for this. We extract four bytes at offset 20. Yes, you can move backwards. Use the addition operation, add the extracted value to the message len, and then store the result in a cumulative underscore size. It is relative to our byte extract, and the endianness is set to little. Finally, we see if the overflow exists by comparing the total data size field against our calculated variable cumulative size and byte test. Now, you're probably wondering how you know exactly where you are in a file when using relative detection options. This is tracked in the DOE pointer, which stands for detect offset n. This is where Snort keeps track of its position in a packet and how you can use detection modifiers such as distance, within, and relative detection options. If you had a content match for security, the DOE pointer would be positioned at the next byte after the word security. The important thing to note here is that there are options that do not move the pointer. All of the byte operations move the DOE pointer except for byte test. I'm not going to go into depth on PCRE since it's a fairly in-depth topic by itself. This is the generic syntax of how we use it in an example of a malware CNC rule. You can use PCREs to detect something without having to write multiple rules. You can see here we look for the string info, or app, followed by .php and the message parameter. Then we anchor it to the URI buffer. Yes, the snort buffers are available when using a PCRE, and we specify the U flag for the URI buffer and the I flag for the case insensitive match. I would recommend checking out regex 101 if you're interested in creating regular expressions on your own. The final option is SID and rev. A SID number is absolutely required in a rule. Snort will not begin processing traffic if a rule fails to specify a SID. Revision is optional and is used for version control. In the official Snort rule set, every time we change an existing rule, we increase the revision number to reflect that. For your own custom rules, it is recommended that you use a SID number of 1 million or greater. This ensures that there will not be a SID collision with anything in the official Snort rule set. Thank you for taking your time to watch this video in the Snort video series. By now, you should have a good understanding of the basics of the Snort 2 rule writing. I recommend checking out the Snort 2 Labs video to apply what you've learned. Thank you.